Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for both uh, joining and for your patience, um, but we're ready to get going. And I, I, um, I'm Rui de Figueiredo. I'm a, pro a professor of the Graduate School and an associate professor emeritus in the Haas School of Business and the Department of Political Science. I'm also the chair of the Weinstock Lecture Committee. Um, and along with the Graduate Division, the Graduate Council of the Academic Senate, and my fellow committee members, Isha Ray from the Energy and Resources Group, I'll keep on, <laughs> and uh, Michael Watts uh, from, yes, I can give the talk as well, from Geography. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to welcome you to the Barbara Weinstock Lectures on the Morals of Trade. Uh, today's lecture will be given by Kevin Bales, who I'll uh, provide an introduction to in a minute, and it's a real pleasure to have him. Um, we're pleased to uh, co-sponsor this lecture and discussion which will follow tomorrow with the help of the following departments and programs on campus. And, and we extend many thanks to Ethnic Studies, the Human Rights Center, Economics, Berkeley Law, and the Center for Latin American Studies. Let me start by just giving a quick word about the Weinstock Lectures uh, and the Weinstock Lecture Endowment. In 1902, uh, over 100 years ago, Harris Weinstock, in the honor of his wife Barbara, endowed a fund to support an annual public lecture on the morals of trade. His goal was, in his own words, to support, and I quote, a better and cleaner day in store for all destined to spend their lives in commercial pursuits. The thing to do is to bring this hoped for day as near to our own as possible. The California University Lectureship on the Morals of Trade is a small effort in that direction, he wrote. Um, with today's lecture, uh, the first ever Weinstock lecture to focus on the morals of trade in human beings, uh, we feel very aligned with the original motives behind this endowment. Now, we're really happy to see you today, but I want to remind everyone that um, we are having a discussion tomorrow as well with a distinguished panel which will discuss Kevin Bale's presentation today. Uh, it'll include our, a, a number of faculty from, from campus, Arlie Hochschild from uh, sociology, Enrique Lopez Lira from the Center for Labor Research and Education, and Eric Stover from the law school. So th this panel will effectively respond and comment on Professor Bell's lecture, um, and will uh, continue the discussion that we start today. So it's a, actually a two-day event, and we, it'll be at the exact same uh, place. I was going to say the exact same time, but hopefully starting 15 minutes earlier tomorrow. Um, and we'll be, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be an opportunity for even more engagement on this really kind of critical topic. So with that said, I, I want to say a few words about today's uh, distinguished speaker. Kevin Bales um, is a professor of contemporary slavery and research director of the Rights Lab at the University of Nottingham in the UK. He co-founded the American NGO, Free the Slaves. And his 1999 book, Disposable People, New Slavery in the Global Economy, has been published in 12 languages. Bishop Desmond Tutu called it, and I quote, a well-researched, scholarly, and deeply dis disturbing expose of modern slavery. The film, some of you might have seen, based on Disposable People, which he co-wrote, won both the Peabody Award and not one, but two Emmy Awards. The Association of British, British Universities has named his work one of 100 world-changing discoveries. In 2007, he published Ending Slavery, How We Free Today Slaves. In 2009, with Ron Sudalter, he published The Slave Next Door, Modern Slavery in the United States. And in 2016, his research institute was awarded the Queen's Anniversary Prize. And he also published Blood and Earth, Modern Slavery, Ecocide, and The Secret to Saving the World, which leads into his discussion today. I won't steal his thunder by announcing his title. I'll let Kevin do that. But I just want to say it's a real privilege and honor to have you here. Uh, and um, we really look forward to two days of very lively and, and, uh, and what is really an important discussion. Kevin? That was a very kind introduction. Thank you so much. And, uh, and of course, you read out the good bits. And then there's you know, the things from my old dean and the president of the college. You know, they, they, they weren't so nice. But it... 
there. Thank you about that. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot I want to tell you about. So I'm going to move through a lot of slides fairly quickly, because one of the things that's really come to us, particularly after we um, established the Rights Lab, was how, and this sounds a little bit like a recent film, everything was everything all at once, all the time, everywhere, and all completely linked together. We began to look out across our space, looking at contemporary forms of slavery, and realize, oh my goodness, this has powerful ecological environmental impacts. Oh my goodness, this is actually tied up with religious expression for a whole number of violent and conflictual groups. Oh my goodness, this is linked to women's empowerment in different parts of the world. And also, as we already knew, but we found out in much more detail, it was linked into all sorts of supply chain issues that, that very much come into also moral questions about trade and, and like that. So I'll just say that the Rights Lab, we've been very fortunate over the last five years to build up something called the Rights Lab, which is a research institute focusing simply on contemporary forms of slavery. And we've now reached about 80, 80 researchers based within the Rights Lab, all working on contemporary forms of slavery, but in different teams. And you'll see what some of those different teams have actually done, because I don't, I don't know how to operate satellites, but we have a whole team that does. Now, this will be the most wordy slide you have to look at, but it's just to, to repeat what I said a second ago about there's, there's an intersectionality. I have to say, when I started working on contemporary forms of slavery, I was seen as a niche of a niche, probably of another niche. And now we're beginning to realize you can't lift a rock hardly anywhere in the world without finding some linkage, linkages that have to do with how it fits into the politics, how it fits into the economy, how it fix, fits into the environmental issues, and so forth. So I wanted to just warn you that I'm going to be shooting around in different directions, but also trying to put it all together in the same basket. Now, one of the things, though, you, you may not know about contemporary slavery is that the cost of acquiring a person into slavery today is at its lowest point in, in human history. Uh, I have a little note here at the bottom because Winthrop Jordan, Wynn Jordan taught here for many, many years and then he and I became great friends after his retirement. And he helped me bring together, he was a historian, a lot of the fundamental data that we use to come to understand what was the, the economic value of people in slavery in the past. And fundamentally, um, we had to use things like oxen because there wouldn't be monetary numbers that we could compare and understand, but an ox is an ox is an ox, and you are able to usually keep find out what, what oxen were worth at different times. And as you can see in the past, uh, the, the cost of acquiring a person into slavery on average would be something like two oxen, four oxen, eight oxen, and then when you get to 1850, where we, we can turn it into 1850 US dollars, it was still something like four to six oxen per, for, a, for a normal average male agricultural worker person who had been being enslaved, <clears throat> who were going for about $1,200 on the market, which in today's money is $46,000. But now look below, and you begin to see that in the Cote d'Ivoire, I've seen, literally seen, a young man, very much like an agricultural worker in the Deep South before the Civil War, but changing hands in a market in, in the Ivory Coast for $40. I've seen girls going for more in Thailand, but that's because they were being used for commercial sexual exploitation, and the profits, as you can see, were, were obscene, 8,000% profit per year on that, on that purchase price. I want to show you a little picture of where the people are, where the density of slavery around the world as well. This is the fundamentals, the sort of foundational things. Notice that, uh, well, the, the, the colors are high into the darker, lower into the, uh, into the yellow. But the key point here is that you notice there are no blank countries that don't have a shade. 
when we began to build the Global Slavery Index back in 2012, 13, 14, and we were actually able to collect information on countries all over the world and also build uh, statistical estimation for some countries where we couldn't get direct uh, figures as well, we began to realize there were no countries without slavery. And I used to actually stand up at it and say, well, Iceland, you know, it doesn't. And then I said that once in a, in a talk, and there was a woman who, who put her hand up and said, I'm, I'm a member of the Icelandic parliament, and we have it too. And I realized it's, it really can be everywhere. There's something like 40 million to 45 million people in slavery. That's our best estimations at the moment around the world, and that's a very conservative estimation. But you can see that the densities are in those places that you might expect, poorer places, places with looser governments, or places where law enforcement doesn't necessarily work as well as it might, places where there is a tremendous amount of environmental possibility for criminals, as opposed to just other types of, poss of possibilities. But if you chart the cost of people over time, um, you actually get this chart. So this is also where when Jordan had helped me to work all the way back to 2000 BC and figure out the, the value of people over time. And you can see that it, var it varies along in terms of something like 40,000, 50,000, 30,000, and so forth over a long time. And then an exact reflection of the dramatic increase in the global population in my lifetime, in our lifetimes, we see this complete collapse of the cost of human beings, of the economic cost of, of human beings. And I have to say, for a lot of people in the world, well, I'll come to that, but it's not even a cost. It's just about rounding people up if, if you need to. These, are, these, these boys are, are, are a very good example of that. So this is in Nepal. Uh, they're, they're poor kids from a, from a rural background. Their parents have a little farm space. Uh, and, a, and a man shows up one day who seems nice and who seems well-dressed, and he says, you know, we need some boys to help us do some hauling, and uh, we can take good care of them, and we'll give you a little bit of an advance on their wages and we'll kept them fed and, and so forth. And it's, it's a terrible decision for a family to make, and especially for a mother, I think, to make it, and, and to say, can I let this boy go? And can I trust these men? But we certainly need food. We certainly need income. We're in dire straits in terms of poverty. And so they let them go. But the problem is that once they leave, they're never seen, very often never seen again. The lies of the person who's lured them away, the tiny amount of, of cash that they've handed over, and I mean a tiny amount of cash, and they use them as beasts of burden. You know, in Nepal, there aren't roads in a lot of the mountains. It's all pathways up and down. And they, load, they carry these big chunks of stone. Some of these will be used for tombstones. Some of these will ultimately might end up on a, on a kitchen counter top, even in the United States. Um, and you can see the pathways sort of snaking down into the deep valleys between the Himalayan mountains. But here's the key thing that's both horrific but perfectly demonstrates the disposability of contemporary people in contemporary slavery. They fall down, these boys. They, they carry their own weight in stone and they go down rocky paths and they fall down into, into ravines or into gullies. And when the people who are driving them come along, they go down to them and they take the stones off but they leave the boy. And they leave the boy because medical care for the broken leg or whatever it is exceeds significantly the cost of a simply acquiring another boy. So they retrieve the stone but leave the boy. It's a disposable input. And that's one of the key differences of, of today is that people in slavery in the past were significant capital purchases. These today are very likely to be much more like a styrofoam cup, the, one, the sort that you take and you use and you drink from and then you crumple it up and you toss it away because they're, it's disposable. Now, of course, we wouldn't do that in California now because we're all eco-friendly, but you understand what, I, what I'm getting at with that. So there's, there's a paradox with this, right? And that is, one is that we've reached this dis point of disposability 
in the economic value of people in slavery. And of course, it's up and down across the, uh, uh, the population of people in slavery. But the other part of it is that with the population now past 8 billion, the 45 million in, in, uh, people who might be in slavery in the world is actually just one half of 1% of the global population. There were times in, in human past when you might have been at 10%, 20%, 30%, and particularly in some of the great slave spaces, right? If you think about the American South before the Civil War, where you've got millions of people in slavery and millions of people who are enslaving them, but it's more a, almost a, a balance, right? It's about a one-third, two-thirds thing. But now, slaves with vir virtually no value, and in some ways, just this tiny part of the global population. And yet, and I, I want to apologize for this, this is my nerd, I get one nerd slide per <laughs> talk, but you know, here's, and I won't walk through them all, I just point out human development index, you all know what that is, negatively correlated with, with situations of slavery. The, the prevalence of, all, all of these are, are measures by, between human development, uh, between um, free access to financial services, all the things that make societies work well are, have a strong negative correlation with the amount of slavery that occurs within them. So much, and which is also fascinating because they're such a small part of the populations. And yet, just their presence in higher levels as opposed to lower levels brings about something that is somehow pushing down on the economics and pushing down on the opportunity and so forth. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna break this out now and leave that big global nerdy part and start to narrow down a bit and talk about different ways that this is manifested as we go along. One of them is about what happens at the global scale, particularly in terms of climate change. Now, this is a funny kind of factoid, uh, but it's, it's, it's one that's, that's also fairly powerful. So if we thought of slavery as being a country or a US state, in terms of population, it would be, it would be the size of Algeria, or it's about a few million more than the population of California. But it's, you know, it's, it's not that much more than California. Or Ukraine. or Ukraine, you're right. Ukraine is almost spot on with that. Um, and if it were producing what we think it is, the United Nations works on this a lot and says that slavery crime generates about $150 billion a year into the global economy. But $150 billion a year is the GDP of Bulgaria. Or to my mind, mind blowing is Arkansas has a GDP of $150 billion a year. I grew up in Oklahoma and we had no time for people from Arkansas and we never assumed that any of them had anything, but apparently they have $150 billion a year, even in Arkansas. So if slavery were a country or a state, it would be a small, poor state, but when we were able to begin the measurement of CO2 emissions, treating across all the slave-based operations of deforestation, of mining, of brick making, of burning of, of coal, burning of old tires to make bricks. I mean, as we began to pull together over a number of years, everything that we could find that would be slave-based work that would generate CO2 into the atmosphere. And remember, these are criminals who are doing this so they don't follow the regulations of EPA right? They, they, they're not going there. It turns out that China and the United States, we know, put out a lot of CO2 into the air. But after those two, slavery is the third largest emitter of CO2 on the planet, if it were a country. So it's a small, poor country that is also the third largest emitter of CO2 in the world. Here's another chart of that. And you can see how it compares to the Russian Federation, to India, to Japan. S -s Slavery, as a, if you treated it as a country, is the third largest emitter of CO2. Now, nowhere near the United States, nowhere near China, because those are the, those are the big ones. But, 
And the thing that, when I first worked through all these stats and came to that conclusion, well, I have to say, when I first went through all these stats and came to that conclusion, I thought, I've done something terribly wrong. This, this can't be right. I can't have 45 million people in the world who are, in fact, the third largest emitter of CO2 because they don't even own factories, but they're involved in this work. And I actually, Bill McKibben and I used to be on a thing together, and, and I sent it all to him. He's the guy who started 350.org. He's one of the great environmentalists who measures this sort of thing. And I got his team to go through the whole thing. And they said, no, we get the same results, exactly the same results. And we were making conservative estimations because we're scholars. <laughs> you, you don't go wild. You, this is, we were working on the conservative side of it. And we got to this number. And I was, well, as we say where I live, I was gobsmacked. <laughs> but I also knew I had the, uh, one of the best factoids ever for putting the news out about it. Now. What, what are the things that happens is that we begin to realize it's not just CO2, which I'll come back to some CO2 in a minute, but it's a, a whole series of ways that contemporary slavery has these negative outcomes. Some are linked to CO2, some are linked to other types of environmental concerns, but some are linked to just sheer violence and conflict and disruption and disruption of economies and so forth. And a lot of them are driving this, this climate change as well. So here I go into some examples. This example looks at illegal deforestation and illegal fishing, and species loss and child slavery, child rape, and then women shrimp workers who are caught up in sweatshops and held in sweatshops. But I'll, you'll see where all that fits together. Now this is a satellite image from, from our satellite team. Um, this is a, a photo from space of the UNESCO World Heritage Site of the Shunderbans mangrove forest at the bottom of Bangladesh. So this is an enormous mangrove forest at the bottom of Bangladesh. It's really important because, you know, over here in the Western Hemisphere, we know the greatest carbon sink in our zone is the Amazon. But in all of Asia, the Shunderbund's mangrove forest is the, is the largest carbon sink, you know, the, 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 the forest that sucks the most bad stuff out of the air and so forth. Um, there shouldn't be anything <laughs> in a picture of the UNESCO World Heritage Site except trees. But you can see there's something else going on here. And I, I went, I was, down there in canoes and working on this when I was working on the book about uh, about climate and slavery and you can see what look like buildings and boats in that in that inlet but those aren't buildings those are fish drying racks and children very like the children in Nepal have been lured down from their families upriver above the Shindermans and people have gone to them and said, we know you have 12 kids and you, we know you're having trouble feeding them all the time, but we've got, if you've got a 10-year-old you know, boy or a 12-year-old boy, you can come with us. He can work seasonally in, the, in processing fish uh, and they bring them down and then they disappear and the, and the parents often never see them again. And they work like this outside in fish guts in pretty horrific conditions um, up to 24 hours a day because they have to process the fish as fast as they can as it's coming off the boats. Sometimes they'll have a break, but sometimes the boats come on. And then they have to put them on these, what look like uh, buildings from the satellite are actually these giant racks where they're cutting the fish and hanging them on the racks and so forth. And you can see some racks in the background that are stacked up to get more air and wind across them. And one of my colleagues, who is a very brave Bangladeshi photographer, actually got a picture of a modern day slave driver beating children to get them to move faster on the racks. Now, I, was, I had the great good fortune to able to, to get with four of these boys who managed to escape. And, and I saw them the next day after they escaped. They literally put themselves under a giant pile of fish because they knew the person who had the boat. And when he went out, he, he covered it up and they, and they went back up river and I was able to get with them the next day. And, I, and I, one of the things that I talked to them about 
was what was, you know, what was it like? What was going on? And they talked about being beaten. They talked about how terrible the food was. They talked about sexual, being sexually assaulted. I asked them about their health and they all said, well, you know, the worst thing was the diarrhea. They, they didn't have any other word for it, but they just said, you know, everybody had diarrhea. A lot of the time, several people died of diarrhea, whatever that meant exactly. And I said, well, okay, if that's, okay, that's the worst. And then what about the next thing? What was the next most problematic health challenge that you had? And this was the thing that floored me because every one of the children separately told me, boys separately told me, that they either knew or had watched as one of the other children were eaten by a tiger. Now, I know it's shocking, and yet, I'm going to just loop back to point out that one of the reasons the Schunderbunds is a UNESCO World Heritage Site is because it's the last free and open breeding ground for Bengal tigers. Mm -hmm. It's one of the last places that it's totally protected. And that when, when the criminals come in and push, cut down all the trees and push the prey animals and the tigers out of the space, the tigers can't just move because tigers are territorial, they'd have to fight another tiger. So they wait and they take the new prey animal, which has been offered to them, which is children. But I have to say, I was as shocked as you just were, and it still kind of haunts me about how, how that all works through. Now, one of the things that we were excited about in a, in a weird, sad but positive way, is that after we were able to establish in the lab a, a team that works with satellite imagery, was I, was, I, was, I went to the t that team and said, here's the place where I, I, I know, here's the GPS coordinates for one. Do you think there are, can you help us find out what else is going on in, in the Schinderbund's UNESCO World Heritage Site? And within a couple of days, they came back and they said, well, are you, uh, you're talking about the other seven camps, right? And I said, no, I've only ever seen one. I've only been, ever been to one. I didn't know there were seven camps. They said, oh, yeah, there's seven more. And we can tell you where they were over the last 20 years in all the satellite data. And we were able, to, with that, to begin to push the Bangladeshi government to at least tell them where the prime was and so forth. It, not much happened because there's literally something called the shrimp mafia in Bangladesh, which has a, a very strong hold on the Bangladeshi government. And a lot of the shrimp that that's also gets brought up through the Shunderbans goes into uh, to local towns where almost all very poor women are given these jobs to vein and pack and all this stuff. And I've, I've interviewed a lot of them and, and they've been trying to organize as their labor and they've been brutalized for, for trying to do that. But it ends up, and as it says, it ends up here. So, you know, with shrimp that some of us have eaten some shrimp <laughs> lately, and uh, uh, 2.4 billion pounds of seafood that the United States imports, and 90% of the shrimp that comes into the United States comes from Southeast Asia, and which means a lot of it has to be coming from there as well. I'm going to jump to another one. Um, this is about slavery's impact, but with illegal mining and brick making and illegal emissions and, and resulting species loss as well. So this is a picture of the red line. I appreciate red, green, colorblind is tricky. So if you've got it, I've got it a little bit. But um, the red line is actually the, the, the boundary of what's called the brick belt in India. And in, it's India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Bangladesh are all encompassed in that, that red line. Um, it's a place where underneath the soil, there's a kind of clay that you can basically dig, pack, make it wet, shape it into bricks, fire it in open kilns of different sorts, and it supplies all the bricks for all of India, Nepal, a lot of other places like that. Um, it's it's a, a long, for a long time we've understood about how families are lured into situations of uh, debt, and then that turns into coercion, and that turns into fundamental types of enslavement. And it's, it'll be the whole family, so the, the children are often shaping bricks out of mud, uh, as well as the moms. Some of the men are doing more of the lifting and, and shifting and firing, but sometimes the children are, are, are doing it as well. And 
one of the things that even while I had spent time in brick kilns, um, all the way back in the 1990s, because they're a significant part of that first book that I wrote about slavery. And I was able to witness it all up close and even interview brick kiln owners about how they did what they did and why they did it the way they did it. Um, we didn't understand and we couldn't find out how big was this industry? How many brick kilns were there? How, how is all this supplied? It's a kind of seasonal job, but, and how do they hold on to people afterwards? So another tiny bit of science was just that we used some crowdsourcing to train up a lot of, mostly university students, where go into this crowdsourcing space where, we were, where they would learn how to identify the brick kilns in satellite images and be able to find, see one in a satellite image and then mark it in a way. Now what they didn't know, they, and they were very pleased to be able to do this work, but what they didn't know was that in fact, we had a, a whole series of algorithms behind the scene, a, a machine learning. And, and it was learning how from the crowdsource, they were teaching the, the ML. Some people call it AI, but we don't really have AI yet. But they were teaching the ML how to identify and see these particular things in the satellite imagery. And the point occurred that finally we were able to say, it learned and then it said, I will now tell you and find you all the brick kilns in all of South Asia. So this was a nice piece in the Guardian about how that happened. And, and, and it said we were teaching an AI, but it, was, it wasn't, it was an, you know, but here's, here's the punchline. So every one of those yellow dots is a brick kiln. And we didn't know. We literally, we, we knew where the brick kiln, we knew where some brick kilns were, but we didn't know where they all were. So we have now have a GPS coordinate for every one of the 55,387 brick kilns in Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India. And <clears throat> since I've spent a lot of time in brick kilns, and I, I, I know you could at least say there's about 10 people on average in a situation of enslavement on brick kilns, that we are probably talking about half a million people who are caught up in that time of slavery. Now, this is, you think, well, this is just bricks, right? This is just bricks, so what's the problem? Well, one of the key problems is that there's no control over how they're fired and as well. So while the people are being treated very poorly, in fact, they're being caught up in slavery and worked in terrible situations, and it's very dangerous work because it's very easy to fall into the kilns and for a lot of things, but how do they fire them? They use old motor oil, they use old tires, and then a little bit of wood and other things that are not just carcinogenic, but are in fact regarded. In the United States, if you have a giant pile of old automobile tires and it catches fire, that's a grade one environmental disaster and it brings in the EPA, right? There, it's, it's 55,000 chimneys all putting out incredibly sooty, dangerous carcinogenic smoke and so forth. And also generating that kind of CO2 that seems to make it the third largest emitter of CO2 as, as, a, as an activity. Right? One more of these. This time illegal forest deforestation, illegal emissions, species loss, and so forth. So one of the areas that I first looked at in the Americas was in Brazil, this isn't in the Amazon, it's in the Pantanal, which is to the west of the Amazon. It's, it's, a, it's a lower kind of forest. It's not as, as, as rich and thick as the Amazon. But uh, certainly when I was there, now getting on 20 years ago to see the first ones of those, they were cutting down these forests, these protected forests, illegally, of course. Criminals were doing this. They had rounded up Simtera, landless people, who were able to, they were able to trick into jobs and take out and usually take them out at night so they wouldn't know where they were ending up in the woods. And then they would cut everything around them uh, and begin to and make these, these clay ovens where they would convert the wood into charcoal. And, and in some ways, the, the thing that made me crazy was just the fact that it, was, it wasn't charcoal for barbecues. It was charcoal to feed the Brazilian steel industry because Brazil doesn't have coke, 
and, and the right kinds of coal to fire iron into steel. But you can use wood charcoal to do it, which to my mind, it's, you know, it'd be like chopping down giant redwoods to do barbecues or something like that. I mean, it'd be that kind of crazy. But that's, that's where it was all going and into the Brazilian steel industry. A, a, a satellite shot again, just to show you the bits they've cut, completely clear cut the forest and the forest that's still there. And, and those little bumps are those clay based ovens and, and so forth that where they were, were turning it. Now, if you go back to that space now, there, are, there is no forest. There are vast areas of that part of, of the Pantanal have, have just been completely deforested. And it's all of kind of big plain now, of grassy plain and like that. And the steel industry there is still cranking away. If there's anything that's positive here, it's just that we're beginning to bring these techniques together so that we begin to say, okay, we can begin to see more of this and think about where to go to operate against it because we can layer up both deforestation and other types of information as well. So that's, that's Brazil, that's all of Brazil. And you can see where the Amazon is, it's that big blue bit at the top. And then if I zoom in, this isn't all of Brazil, this is just the Amazon. And you can see the bit that's green, and you can see the Amazon up there because it's kind of purpley, it's that big water course, the green bit. And then you can see the yellow bits, and the yellow bits are all the parts of the Amazon, this is a few years ago now, it's be worse now, but all the parts of the Amazon that are supposed to be inviolable, never touched, never cut, but have been cut. So the yellow parts are the bits where it's slowly been encroaching inward and inward and inward and closer into the depths of the Amazonian basin. <clears throat> and you can sort of see how the, how the I've, I've drawn the red line so you can see how that's been marching ahead. But then we were able, because there, there's some amazingly good law enforcement in Brazil, even if they have a terrible time under a president like Bolsonaro, but they could, they could link us to the GPS coordinates of murders and, and slavery cases, and the big blue dots means lots of slavery cases in one place. But you can see exactly how it operates, so that if you go inside the 2018 curve and you go up to the right, and you can see a big blue dot, that's, that's more than 40, cases of enslavement, and you can see that it's surrounded by, I think it's 12 or 10 known murders. Now, what would have happened was that somebody would have rounded up Simtera, offered them a job, taken them away at night, put them into that part of the forest, and begin to cut, because it was a good place to cut. And there was, might have been some special trees there that they wanted to take out that would be high value trees. But one of the things that happened in those situations that happens almost all the time is we're back to the disposability com concept, is that they will literally often work them near to death. And then rather than leave them behind or uh, even worse, go let them go, get away so that they might report, they just shoot them. So they shoot them and bury them in the forest. And then it's very hard to find. So the, the ones that we can see that we know about, all of those blue dots and all of those red dots, um, we know that's a small fraction of what's actually happened in that space. And it goes into this. I mean, this is, it's, it's particularly surprised me when I learned how many types of plumbing fixtures come from Brazil. And that, you know, every day I, I may be touching steel that's been made from, from that, that kind of situation. Okay, I wanna shift for a moment and to, as I go into another example, but this isn't so much about the environmental side, it's about what's happening with the, what we're discovering is this very intense interaction between slavery and conflict. So slavery and child soldiers and genocide and sexual assault, and, and in fact, in this case, the auction of young slaves. But I'll point out first that just in the last couple of years, we've taken the Uppsala <laughs> World Conflict Database if some of you will know that, that, that in Sweden they have this place where they record all the conflicts. And then we've, we've, we've brought a team of, of coders and researchers and we, we said, okay, so for every single conflict that occurred uh, between 1989 and 2016, uh, we want to search 
every source that we can and see if there was any enslavement occurring in that conflict. I had been working in places like Eastern Congo, where I was seeing child soldiers on the ground. I was seeing child soldiers on the ground in Western Africa. I was seeing children who I was very concerned about in places like Pakistan. And we wanted to see, is there a clear linkage between what happens, particularly in these less, what they, what they sometimes call low intensity conflicts, which are, means not major wars cr carried forward by entire countries like Russia versus Ukraine, but small groups fighting each other in places. When we did that, and when we coded very conservatively, and we also built it into a contemporary slavery and armed conflict database, um, of which there were 171 conflicts in that time period, totaling 1,113 1, conflict years, because the conflicts last more than one year, so it comes to that. So we, we, we coded for all the different types of enslavement, if there were any, and I have to say, I was expecting to find it, but I didn't expect to find basically 90, almost 90% of the conflicts involved enslaved, enslaved either child soldiers or forced labor or sexual exploitation and forced marriage or, or human trafficking, which often involved the selling of people after they had been ca captured by an armed group. Okay. Now that was across all of the conflicts in the world but I'm gonna focus down in the set just now on a particular one of those to, do, to really illustrate it. Now we're pushing the data backwards and we're pushing the data forwards and we wanna see what it's gonna turn out to be if we look much longer. But in fact, if you look back in history, one of the things that I'm working on with a historian is a whole book, which will be about how conflict and slavery have been marching along hand in hand pretty much since the Bronze Age collapse. And, and it's pretty clear how you do that. Um, you know, Rome ran on slavery the way the United States runs on oil. And it was the fundamental foundation of that economy. The <clears throat> particular one I wanna to point to as an illustration is, uh, is, 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 is ISIS. And I don't know if you know the ISIS online magazine, Dabiq. Um, and I have to immediately give you a health warning and say, don't go look it up yourself because um, Homeland Security will come and visit you. Uh, but there are sometimes, usually at a university, a, a particular computer you can use to look at, at dicey websites owned by terrorist groups. Um, so anyway, just don't, yeah, don't, <laughs> don't just roll up and say, oh, let's see what's in Dubique this week. You know. um, but notice the key article in this particular issue, the revival of slavery before the hour. Now, the, it sounds, wait, before the hour. In fact, that's a, that's a key code phrase for um, members of ISIS. Before the hour is the indication of the beginning of the process of the end of the world. So it's, it's the cataclysmic, apocalyptic, uh, ending of the world as we know it and the reestablishment of the world as, as, an, as an ISIS Islam, Islamic state. Right? And, and the notion, of, and this is a, this code phrase before the hour is, what, what are those signs that we're going to witness when we know the end of the world is nigh? Right? And one of them is about the revival of slavery. And it was interesting that that's exactly one of the things that they focused on in their work strategically and tactically, very carefully in bureaucratic ways uh, as for example, and this is where we were able to get hold of captured ISIS documents from their invasion of the Sinjar area where the Yazidis live. And we were able to analyze those for the things that I'm going to show you. But up at the top is where the Yazidis lived the ISIS forces moved into that space. They actually had a religious like jury that, that worked carefully through. Before they invaded, they asked this religious jury of, of, of exactly who are these Yazidis and how should we treat them? Some thought they might have been lapsed Muslims. Some thought they might be something else. And at the end of the day, they said, no, they're mushrik, which means devil worshipers. 
So the only thing you can do with them is kill them. So they, they gave them that order. And they established a very systematic process where they entered all of the towns in that province. And then they began to immediately round up the entire population of each town. Early in the morning, they would surround them at night. And then you can see the outcomes according to their age and their gender. And notice that elderly women were separated. Uh, women that were thought to be past childbearing, they were separated, marched off somewhere else, and then they would all be killed and usually put into a mass grave. And likewise, men, uh, uh, mature men, were assumed to be dangerous, and they would be marched off to someplace else, and again, it would be a mass grave and a mass execution. But you can see what was happening with women and children. Boys were being sent into military training. Boys were being sent into other types of work. But particularly the thing that the, that the, the religious committee said was OK was to remember that women aren't any equal to men, according to the way they see the world, and that once impregnated, they become carriers from ISIS. Right. They begin. This is a it's a it's a forced impregnation as there's a, a, an amazing old article from quite a long time ago, but it was called forced impregnation as genocide. And it's about replacement through impregnation. Right. And you can see that there were all I, can, I won't go into all of them, but you can see that there were some of the women were sold. Some of them were were auctioned in public auctions. Some of them were auctioned on online auctions. And this was one of the things that surprised us. We didn't understand this until after we captured the documents that they were doing online auctions. And we also then discovered that a lot of the women who had really disappeared were the ones who had been purchased in online auctions and then shipped off to we don't know where. And their families don't know where. They're somewhere around the Middle East, probably. But it's, it's, the, it's the part of the population that hasn't been found yet. So you can see, sold all the terrible types of things, given as gifts and so forth. And one of the things that was powerful about this was how we began to say, what was tactical about this? And what was strategic about this? And we begin to also apply that same question to other types of conflict about, you could use it for the American Civil War. You can look back to the, what happened in the American Civil War and say, what was the tactical use of African Americans by the Confederacy? What was the tactical use of African Americans by the Union? What were the strategic things? Well, it was the strategy was on both sides. One was to hold on to it, so slavery, and the other was to maybe stop it, and then we'll get around to that later possibly kind of thing. But the point was they were working it very clearly in both directions and working it to in ways that we are now coming under, to understand that we hadn't really grasped before about the nature of this of this slavement, slavery within conflict becoming so much part of a genocidal approach. The other thing that we could tell from the internal documents is that they were making about $2 million a day of, by selling people that they, were, that they had taken. And, 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 it, and f fascinating to me that in, in Arabic, the name of the person who was in charge was the Minister of Spoils. The Minister of Spoils. So um, I'll just point out that we've now launched a much larger study about genocide. And we've been looking at genocides across history. And one of the things that we've been watching is where does slavery come into the genocide? And what we're finding is that if you look closely, it's hard to find a genocide that doesn't have extensive forms of enslavement as a, as a parallel activity, right? As a parallel activity. The Second World War, everyone understands the genocide of the Holocaust. And we all understand seven to eight million people killed in that way. But we also know that there's about 10 to 12 million people who were caught up and used as slave labor in the same, in the same time period. And that there was an overlap between them. And this, the slave labor of the Second World War doesn't get quite the attention that the Holocaust, for with good reason, I'm not trying to make it into, into a fight, but we, when you look back, it turns out we we're finding more. So we're trying to learn about that and try to understand that in the same way that we're trying to look at something that we're starting to call World War Zero. 
the, we're, we, you know, when we started to think about the processes of conflict and enslavement and genocide, and when we look across this, and I, I appreciate I'm out on a limb here and all the historians are gonna kick me in the shin later, but <clears throat> we look at this and say, this 1492 to 1900 period, what? That's not like a bunch of Indian wars. That's not a bunch of just slave trading. This, 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 is a, this is a Euro invasion of the Western hemisphere. And we're saying it needs to be thought of in that way for a while so we can see the big picture. And the, you know, the, there's a, been a recent book called The Other Slavery uh, from someone at California Davis, which is powerful because he understand, he's written about and exposed what the Spanish were doing over that entire period. And, and into the American. So we've been also coding up something we call the Euro Invasion Conflict Database, right? And one of the things that I'll just point to is that we've been turning up things like this, documented genocidal massacres, and this is just the ones in California. Right? Now these aren't vast numbers of, of, I mean, unless you're one of the dead people, it's pretty important to you, but you know, the, but these were significant numbers for the, for the indigenous people who were living in California at the time. And as we work through and say, okay, was this just a conflict or was this a battle? No, actually this was a massacre. And was this a massacre that was just an accidental battle that turned into a massacre? Well, no, and the reason why we can call it a genocidal massacre is because before it occurs, the governor, the lieutenant governor, the local mayors, the preachers are making clear genocidal statements saying we have to kill all of them. I mean, it's there in their newspapers, it's there in their, in their political records. And you say, okay, so that's, a, that's an exterminationist approach, right? This isn't just a fight. It's not just a fight, it's, it's this. And then on the side, slavery as well. Now, Here's a few couple of things I'm just gonna throw out to say this is where we're headed next. One of the things is that we're, we're finding a lot of linkages be between conflict groups who are also very religious and are also very much involved usually in not just the suppression of women but also in things like child and forced marriage. So you know all of these groups, you may not know them, all of these groups, but they're all kind of as, as bad as each other. Um, and they all are very clear about they're acting from a religious basis. <clears throat> and, and that religious basis somehow enables them, makes possible for them, gives them the justification, the religious and spiritual justification to not just kill, but also to enslave and also to have this total control, especially over women and girls. And we're beginning to try to understand, we, we want to try to break this apart. And strangely, uh, there's actually now, if you know, the Templeton Foundation, which is a very odd outfit in, if, you know, I hope no one's here from there, but they're a pretty strange outfit, but they're actually now very interested in, in, in supporting research that looks at the, in a sense, the negative impact of religion. And they, they find this a bit interesting. Right. So... Can we reduce or end slavery in the current global emergency? After all those horrible things that I've told you, can, can I even raise this question? And the answer, the short answer is yes, if a whole lot of positive things happen and we take certain actions and we actually know the likely cost and we also have some proven methods of liberation and reintegration that have worked out over the last 20 to 30 years. And we also know from other economic studies that we're that almost every time you bring a group to freedom, there's an, what we call a freedom dividend. The, the economic activity always increases and the economic turnover always increases. So a couple of those. This, this is one that I know well. 25 years ago, I was in Northern India. I was in villages where they were in hereditary forms of collateral debt bondage slavery, which I appreciate is a long name, but it's, they were in hereditary slavery, families in small villages, oh. Um, and working with local NGOs, we found a way to, to bring these villages to freedom, but it actually involves a kitchen, cooking school meals, inserting, like injecting a school into the village, 
It takes three years for it to happen. But at this point, the NGO that I work with, which is a California-based one called Voices for Freedom, 50 schools in villages with hereditary slavery, 5,000 miles. And here's the fascinating thing, because we've been able to do really tight economic costings, $195 per person to bring them from slavery to freedom. $195, right? Now, things are cheaper in India, right? And especially cheaper in Uttar Pradesh. But, you know, you multiply that up and we're still not into crazy numbers, right? We also know that, um, go ahead, go to the next one. Oh, well, I don't know what's happened now. Oh, there we go. Um, oh, I wanted to do that. I don't know why. Uh, we also know that car carbon credits, um, which are debatable, I totally understand that carbon credits are a debatable situation. Uh, but if you took the simplicity model of carbon credits and you actually said in places like Brazil, we will, you've been forced to cut this forest. We will now pay you to replant this forest and we will bankroll this by selling a carbon credit. And we're gonna do mixed forests, not, not monoculture. But we're gonna put, try to put the Amazon back the way it used to be. We know that if you multiply up just what we know about the deforestation using slavery is that it would be the carbon credits at the, at the normal rate today of carbon credits would be more than enough to pay for the costs of bringing people out of slavery around the planet. So it, it, it estimates, we think we'd be about 27 billion that you could do from all the forests that are being cut by people in slavery, if, if we could go there, right? But what we think we know is about 23 billion, right? It's what, if you amortize it across all of the different levels of slavery around the world, it's about 23 billion would cost, we think it's around $500 to, per person, much more in the United States, five to $10,000, but in Northern India, $195. So, you know, it begins to average up. And, but if you add up what all the anti-slavery groups and all the governmental uh, budgets are for this around the world, you get to 400 million a year at most. So that means 58 more years, but we don't have 58 years. And of course people will live and die in slavery in 58 years. And then we have to do that somehow before the ecological collapse, which the people in slavery are pushing along by through, through deforestation and so forth. So, um, this is where we are on the planetary boundaries. Every place you see red is a place where we've already crossed a line as a, as a global population to create a, a, a situation of, of danger, of ecological and environmental danger. And we, and we know that, that the yellow zones are the places where they're ex still expanding, but they're, but they're not contracting, they're all expanding. So that just takes us to, to this fundamental, thing that I'll finish with and say there's a very interesting set of scenarios which I find myself, and I'm like a congenital pathological optimist. I, I'm a very optimistic person, but I find them worrisome, very worrisome. Because we as a public, we, we're thinking about the disasters, and there, here's, wait, there's, there's some kind of cold, wet river that's flowing over us now, and we're all supposed to worry about that, but in fact, we've got to think big and get away from this disaster snowball and like that. What are these scenarios? Well, I'll start with the worst one, right? The Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum model. So this was like millions of years ago on planet Earth, but it was a time when CO2 began to increase very dramatically over a very, a pretty long period of time. And it led to a situation where the, 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 the mean temperatures went up between five and eight degrees centigrade. To the point that doesn't seem like a lot, but half the life forms in the oceans died at, during that time period. Huge areas of the earth began to be deserts. Antarctica lost its ice. I mean, it was a, it was a very dramatic alteration into in the entire ecosystem of the planet. Uh, it's just that we're now moving our CO2 up the ladder faster than happened in the Paleocene, Eocene period, right? So it, we're actually moving much more quickly in, in that direction. And, and, you know, 
it, to the point that some of the people in this room might actually see some of that start to happen. Or we could have these anthropogenic impacts all over the world create problems for us, whether in conflict or in, in, in the environment or in business or ignoring it and, and not letting us worry about where our shrimp comes from or like that. And, and it tends to, all of that tends to underfund and delay and halt all anti-slavery activities. It's the biz, that's the business as usual model, because that's where we are right now. Or we could actually say, what, what if we were to invest in anti-slavery in those sp specific activities, which are actually dramatically altering ecological and environmental factors? So if you, if you stop people destroying the forest, that's, that's a great move. If you get the same people to replant the forest, that's even better. And, or you stop the, the, the brick making in the way that it's occurring and the CO2 drops very dramatically, we could actually pause the CO2 rise perhaps for some years or something like that. I'm hoping we might go <laughs> for scenario three. I'm not quite sure how we make that happen. There's political scientists here who I'm sure have figured that all out ahead of time. Um, and I know that I'm right up against my time and we started late. So I'll just say, and we're gonna have questions I think as well, but um, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. That was uh, not only thought-provoking, but eye-opening. Um, we will have questions now. In order to um, have questions, I'm going to ask for the assistance, but I also want to just recognize and thank our wonderful partner in the Graduate Division who, more than anyone else, makes this event happen, which is Jane Fink. Uh, um, Jane is uh, going to assist, I, I think because I don't have a lavalier, maybe you can just call on people if you put up sure, your hand, sure. and Jane will, will bring, the, we'll bring the mic and you can ask your question. Kevin, do you want to just take the questions sure, yourself? Sure, yeah, sure, thank sure. you. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. On one of the slides you mentioned hereditary slavery and how um, like a method in resolving slavery out of areas was like through targeting like these villages that were experiencing hereditary enslavement. Um, could you please elaborate on what that means and on the what that process, part? yeah, and what the yeah. process looks like? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's fairly simple. Um, this is, we're talking here about a, a very large area of Northern uh, South Asia. But so uh, Uttar Pradesh, which is a, a state, but you know, it has 700, 50 million people in it, just one state, but so it's a big rural area, and, and but it's also happening in Nepal, it's also happening in Pakistan. Fundamentally, <clears throat> it's almost always, um, the first part of the mechanism is there's a cultural or defined difference between the groups. So a local landowner who's like the big daddy in the area, and then there are these groups who are not even on the, um, on the ladder, of the, of, the, of the Indian caste system. There are people who are off the bottom. So like Coles and others who are tribal, often referred to as tribals. Those quite a few generations ago would have been promised jobs. They would have brought, been brought in to work in a, say an agricultural setting or possibly a mine or even a deforestation project or like this. But this could be, we could be talking about 80, 90, 100 more years ago. And the, the people who bring them in say, you can build a hut, we can give you food, and so forth. Um, but dang, you know, they, they, they never pay their debt. They're, they're, this is advanced to them as a debt. And they're illiterate, and they can't keep read the, 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 the records anyway. And the, and the local landowner, who's a Brahmin or someone else at high caste and has the police on their side, just simply keeps saying, sorry, you, you still haven't made it. Um, you're just going to have to stay on. Now, because they can't leave their community, within a generation or two, they lose any sense of what it could be like to live in a situation of mobility, of freedom, right? They, they have no sense of freedom of movement and very little of even temporality. They have a sense of the present. They must live in this present because they can't, they don't really have a future. They don't even understand their past very well. So that's why it's called 
hereditary collateral debt bondage slavery because they offered themselves as collateral against a debt. Well, actually, it was great-great-grandfather who did that. But there's plenty of written about that particular type of enslavement if you want to. We can, I, can tell, I can tell you some sources later. How's that? Yeah. Yes, sir. This was bracing, sobering. Have you had any, um, have you made any effort to deliver this roadshow to any of the um, parliaments or congresses or executive branches or consortia of governments or you name it, anywhere? Has anybody, has it gotten any traction anytime you've delivered it? And has anybody done the math? I mean, when you do the math and you say, basically, for $23 billion, we could wipe out a whole ton of this, maybe all of it. Um, and uh, you know, it would take us some time, but all we have to do is put the money aside and plow ahead. Have, has anybody actually said, well, we, we, could, we would be happy to cut a channel to make that happen. You just bring the money, or you just bring the this or that. Is there any effort going on to, to instrumentalize all of this? The short answer is, in the most meager ways, if at all. Um, there was a moment, and again, I think it might have been 20 years ago, when I was talking in Seattle and I talked about that 23 billion, or it might have been 19 billion at that point, because it was 20 years ago. And there was someone in the audience, because it was Seattle, who said, you know, I could do that, I could pay for that. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, it wasn't Bill Gates. It wasn't Bill Gates, but, you know, who actually said, well, we could do that. Now, I will say that particular person went on to bankroll a foundation, which has been bankrolling work that's been at the right level and, do, and doing the right kinds of things, um, but not at the scale that, that, that we really need. We re it really needs to be governmental scale, doesn't it? And do, yeah, have we talked to, have I talked to, yeah. I mean, Bill Clinton held my books up at the Global Initiative and said, read this guy's books and we're gonna make this happen and bing, bang, bomb. And I'd come and help planning the, the initiatives and all this kind of stuff. And, even George Bush was barely on side, you know. He didn't, I'm not sure he totally understood it when I talked to him about it, but he, you know, he, he, he seemed like he wanted to do something. Um, Norway's, the government in Norway, I've worked with them closely for a long time now, and they do great things, but they're only Norway, right? You know, they can't, they can't do the big stuff in, in the same ways. And, and it becomes a political issue that fades in and fades out, and slaves don't vote. And if, I, if you're aware of what's going on in, in the UK right now, where the conservatives are actually trying to shut all doors for immigration and refugee status, they're actually creating a situation that we, a lot of us are screaming about because if they do that, it will actually be a gift to human traffickers. Because they say, if someone comes here and then applies under, we have something called a, a, a Modern Slavery Act that I helped write in parliament, right? And we have this mechanism called the National Referral Mechanism where you can say, I've been brought here in slavery, I need to enter this system and I'm gonna go down this pathway and I'm gonna be taken care of. It'll shut the door to that. This, this new law, the Tories say they were gonna pass this law, they're gonna end that. Throw the law out, throw out the anti-slavery law. And we're just, we're gobsmacked and don't know where to go with this. I mean, it's like being under Trump in a weird way because it's like, just the opposite end. And so we're fighting at the minute, for example. So there's people moving backwards, right? As well as the people who move forwards. No, I, and I, you know, maybe it's down to me. Maybe I'm, I'm good, but I'm not good enough, right? You know, maybe if I was Frederick Douglass as opposed to me, right? I could actually move people in the way I, you know, I, I, I would like to have done. Or maybe we just haven't quite hit that tip over point, but, Every time there's another crisis, m many of them are, 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 are things that we really need to think about, like global warming, and need to focus on as well. It, then you, you say, well, do I get everybody in the world out of slavery, or do I try to reduce CO2, or you know what? It's a tricky situation, and I, I'd love your ideas if you can help us figure out how do we make how do we mobilize this in a in a in a way that goes as big as we as it needs to. We've worked on that for years. It's gotten a lot bigger, but it's still not it's still not the Red Cross. You know, it's still not Save the Children or something like that. I don't know if that really answered, but yeah. <laughs>
Yes, ma'am. Sorry, thanks. Um, thank you. Um, and I, I hope the answer to this is not obvious and I'm just not seeing anything, but um, I realize that in the United States it was very yellow, you know, a pale yellow for, for indicating the level of slavery, human slavery. But can you tell me, like, how does it come down in the United States? Like, what does it look like here in ways that we may not have thought of? Yeah. I, certainly, I can do. Um, and one of the things I'll, I'll tell you, though, is that that yellow color does not include what happens in the prison system. Okay? I wish I could, but I can't get clear. It's very interesting that because prisons are now owned and run by corporations, they go under uh, business privacy law. And so you cannot get at the actual internal records of prisons anymore. When, when I moved out of America a long time ago, I'd worked in prisons and you could actually, they were government entities, so you could ask for government. So, so I, I <clears throat> you know, when people ask me, you know, is that, is that state-sponsored slavery in the prisons in the United States? And I, all I can say is, you know, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck, but I can't, Actually, no one will let me dissect that duck to make sure it's a duck, okay? Um, to be totally academically precise about it. In terms of the other, there's a, there's, a, there's a significant amount of enslavement in the directions of agriculture uh, or even construction. After the, the big hurricanes down in New Orleans and Louisiana, uh, they stopped a lot of the trafficking of human beings, of, of mostly women, into commercial sexual exploitation, enslavement into commercial sexual exploitation, because that party town of New Orleans had a lot of that going on. But after the hurricane w wiped it out, that all stopped, and it all began to be replaced by people from South America and Central America, and some from India, and some from Pakistan. They were brought in for demol demolition. Uh, uh, demolishing all the broken buildings and rebuilding and all this kind of stuff. Some of that came to federal, in, right? Um, pretty much almost anything you can think of where you could hide a person away. So we know that there are Chinese gangs from certain state uh, provinces of China, for example, that move people over and put them in the backs of restaurants and put them into brothels and put them into these other, so you've got that kind of work as well. So, you know, I've, I've, I've actually, when we wrote The Slave Next Door, which was about, I wrote that with a co-author, which is about all the types of slavery in the United States. You know, we actually found a case in a, in a circus, right? People who had been lured into this situation and enslaved in a traveling circus in the United States. I mean, that's a weird and strange one, but it, it kind of rolled and rolled. It's like you, if you poke and look and pull the, the, the curtains back, you, you can find it a lot of places in a lot of different things. But you can you know which ones it'll be. It'll be the dirty, dangerous jobs, right? And one and some of these are, are exacerbated by US government policies. So I don't know, I don't know if the law is still exactly like this, but it was when we wrote that book, is that there was one type of visa for nannies to come from Western Europe. In other words, white girls, right? From nice white girl countries, right? So if you were Irish or German or French or Dutch, you had this special nanny visa where you had, where the people would check on you. The government had a person to check to make sure you were safe and fine and you could have a phone that you were given that could you could call immediately if you needed any help. But if you were coming from Peru, right? Chile, Mexico, Guatemala, no such thing, right? A completely different system, right? And you could end up, some of you, you would be, brought with people saying, oh, we're, this is a nanny, but you, you could do anything you liked with them. Almost no protection. So it's a, it's a big country, and there's a lot of entrepreneurial people who aren't nice, right? Mm -hmm. What's another question? What? Okay. Thank you for the lecture. Um, you talked about the slave women uh, who were deveining fish. Mm -hmm. um, are these national governments not acting on slavery because the institution of slavery in their countries are profitable for them? And do you think that international organizations like the UN could help with this? Well, the short answer is yes. The, 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 that, I, that was in Bangladesh in particular. And in Bangladesh, 
there is literally a thing that I don't know how to say it in, Bang in the Bangladeshi language, but it, they call it, it the, the shrimp mafia. Yeah. It, there's so many billions and billions of US dollars that flow in on shrimp and fish into Bangladesh that the government now is in the pocket of these basically mafias. And yeah, uh, there, there's a lot of reasons why they won't want that to happen. When we first found um, the fish camps, uh, I worked with the person who was the um, State Department's ambassador on human trafficking. And he went, he flew to Bangladesh and talked to the prime minister and said, look, here's the, the photographic evidence and here's the locations and here's this and here's that. And he said, oh yeah, that's really bad. That's, we, you know, we'll, we'll do something about that. And they did nothing except um, threaten and expel some of my colleagues, some of the people I'd worked with there who they said, you need to leave the country right away unless you want to get hurt. I mean, it was that, that, it's that kind of mess, right? So there are parts of, the, while, while, while people in slavery are get very little and sometimes they're working on things that actually don't sell for much money or if anything, like a brick, um, there's areas where it's very lucrative and very mean and soprano type people, right? You know, real mafias. Are, are built around it and are, and are not going to open up a way for people to get in there. And it would take tremendous power. The UN um, doesn't have that power. You know, I'm, it's sad but true. I worked in the UN for a while in the anti-slavery and anti-trafficking part of the UN in Vienna. And the best we could do was talk, and, uh, really, and, and push things very slightly. But uh, it, it's the one of the best ideas in the in the history of people, the UN, but it's pretty puny in terms of what it can actually accomplish. Right? Yes, sir. Thank you. This is a, really an amazing talk. Um, I'm glad I made it out here today. Um, I'm glad you did too. One of the things that, that I, I, I was a little bit late, so maybe I missed some of the beginning part of this, but there's clearly a connection between the lives that we live and the existence of slavery as you've described it. Across the board, I mean, from the, what we eat to what, how we decorate our bathrooms, our kitchens, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, those slabs on the back of those boys don't go into their homes, they go into ours. So, you know, what are your thoughts about, rather than finding the odd billionaire that's willing to throw billions of dollars at it, getting a billion people to throw one dollar at it by saying no. I mean, no to not a proposition coming from there, but no to some of the propositions in our own culture about how we live, about what we need to have to feel happy and successful and whatever, you know, in, in our, within our cultural milieus. Any thoughts on that? Well, one of the first thoughts is, of course, we don't have to, we don't have to stop enjoying a lot of things that we do enjoy, even in our obscenely rich lives compared to the rest of the world. Because not all of those things are coming from the hands of people who are caught up in slavery. One of the things that slaveholders don't do is lower their prices. You see, if I'm, if I'm a slaveholder and I make, if I have a giant cocoa farm in West Africa, and cocoa is going for $600 a ton of beans, right? Uh, and I can produce it for $200 a ton. And my neighboring farmers who are honest people can only produce it for $400 or $500 a ton. I don't, I don't compete with them. I want to make $600 a ton that I'm only paying out 200 You know, I mean, the, the profit margins for slavery are so high, you never, it's, they never try to undercut, right? So what, what, I, what that means is that you, then you, you're in this situation where it's sometimes hard to parse out What's the dirty stuff and what's the clean stuff? And one of the, that, the, the book I've written most recently, particularly about the environment, traces a lot of supply chains that you're describing and actually identifies the point at which there's suddenly this sleight of hand and all this slave produced gold, cassiterite, molybdenum, coltan, you name it, right, becomes free right, or okay, or whitewashed, right, or whatever. And, and that's, that's part of that very tricky part. Now, I appreciate what you said, because we've, you know, there have been a couple of times in the history of this anti-slavery movement, this current anti-slavery movement, 
where people have suddenly woke, awake, awakened to something like, co gosh, cocoa has slavery in it. So chocolate has slavery in it. So we need to think about where our chocolate comes from. And we can, you can make slave-free chocolate, that's, that's okay. And for four or five years, there was a huge outcry about this. But I also was working with major chocolate companies and the guy at Mars said, you know, if I change the color of a single M&M in a bag, I get a thousand letters. And in the same year, I'll get three about child slavery and cocoa. And, and, and that's in part because while you're aware and I'm aware and now everybody in the room is aware, but there's a huge, an enormous number of people in the United States, if we were only just talking about the United States, whose immediate concerns about economic life and what they have to do with their responsibilities and the work they have to do and the children they have to support and all of those things preclude an, a, a moment for them often to re reflect in the way that you just reflect and that I reflect as well. So we have to find that way. We have to find that way to spread that word. And it's not easy, right? It's not easy. It's, it's a... It's a, it's a day after day job that we have to bring to it. And then when we cross that line, which this anti-slavery movement has done from the post, the, from the pre-untruth eco media world to the one that we're in now, right? <coughs> the crazy media where you can't even get truth in, into a lot of space, it makes it even harder. Sorry, that, that was, uh, I tried to be optimistic and then I just got pessimistic at the end. Yes, ma'am. Tell me Thank when. Thank you, this is very enlightening. I think one thing that we're hearing in this room is we're all surprised. We did not know this. And it occurs to me that instead of asking billionaires to give you billions of dollars, maybe what you sh could do, uh, what I would try to do if I knew as much as you did, was approach people like Matt Damon, uh, uh, you know, like uh, NPR, that is people who can publicize this so there's much greater awareness. And if, you, if I may, start with the pictures of what's actually happened and mm -hmm. the graphs later to mm -hmm. your conclusory remarks have, uh, you know, they're important, but the punch isn't what we actually see. Oh, yes. These oh, yes. people do this, and this is what's happening to them. And I think, you know, like, um, there are a number of people in Hollywood who like to think of themselves as being socially conscious, and they're ambassadors of goodwill to children or to women, like um, Michelle Yeoh just won. And she is very, very concerned about the plight mm. of women and children in disasters. And these are economic disasters that are very long running. But, you know, these are definitely disasters. So uh, I'm sure you've already done things like this, but I feel like there is room here for them to help you, to help us. Oh, I, and I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. And we've had a, a number of people in Hollywood who have worked with us on this and pushed it along in different ways over the last 20 years. Um, in some ways, and, and, and some of them are still doing so, and actually operating their own NGOs who do things like, um, uh, there's, a, there's, there's one particular movie star down in Los Angeles who has bank, been bankrolling a whole bunch of techie folk who actually run drones over houses and find out who's looking at uh, child-based pornographic uh, imagery that is likely to include enslaved people, and then they reach out to them and shake them up a little bit and all this kind of stuff. I, won't, I can't tell you much more about that. But um, there's, there's always this situation where this never goes away, but it also never quite breaks through. And there have been those times when we've been very suddenly big. So we've been on NPR a lot. We've been in the news a lot. Uh, but it's been very interesting in this post-truth world about how hard it is to get into those outlets when we're all supposed to be coming down to these six, three word, you know, punchlines. And it takes a little bit longer than that. I totally am with you. And don't think I get to ask billionaires all the time. I mean, that only happened, that only happened once a long time ago. And, uh, and so <laughs> uh, we've certainly asked a lot of people a lot over time and do our best to do so. 
This chap over here has been oh, waiting for some time. Yeah. Can I have a oh yeah, sure, 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 sure. Uh, first, uh, thank you for coming here and giving this presentation. Oh, this is great. My pleasure. And um, so I have a question. It's related to the, you know, instead of just what, what can we in the developed world do, what can the slaves do in the form of armed rebellion or any kind of rebellion from, from their side, right, to improve the situation or raise the cost of slavery to the point where it's not as economical to, to run these? So um, you mentioned before, like during the Roman era, there were like floods, there was a slave for almost one slave for every citizen. And, you, and when there were, it was much easier to have slave uprisings at, during those times, the Servile War, Spartacus uprisings. Sure, sure, sure. sure, sure. And especially after the Second Servile War of Spartacus, yes. you know, there were huge changes to the slave code in, in, in the Roman slave, slavery code to, that eventually, it's, you know, they, they had to treat them better or they, had to, they couldn't just beat them to death and, and, and things like this. They had to, to loosen it up, right? And your graph showed that the percentage of slaves has been going down, right, to a, you know, to a much smaller fraction. And to me, th there is a challenge um, in the sense that when you enslave a smaller percentage of people, like you said, people, it kind of goes out of people's vision, the average person's vision, the average person that might sympathize, right? And, you know, for example, conscription is a f could be a form of slavery, right? And during, the, during Vietnam, you know, like uh, <laughs> there were, uprisings throughout U.S. campuses, and you know, that was a factor for, for the defeat. And while now with the Iraq war, my cousin has been getting sent over and over. Uh, he has PTSD. He was in the second battle of Fallujah. His, uh, his, you know, um, he got divorced. Uh, he's on substance abuse now. But there aren't as many uprisings, except maybe Capitol Hill, <laughs> that January 6th, maybe that could be considered something. But there isn't the kind of uh, empathy in the population. There isn't the kind of critical mass, right, for an uprising. No, no. So now, well, uh -huh, I'm sorry. I mean, the, the, the Spartacus model is, is appealing in some ways, but you actually need an incredibly large number of people in slavery who could communicate with each other. And, and slavery is atomizing. So one of the things that we've been learning from people who have come out of slavery uh, who are now working in the lab and, and, uh, and who are getting their PhDs and like that, is, is how it affects the mind and how it affects the mind so that people become atemporal. They live in an eternal present when they're in slavery and they, they're aspatial and they won't move around because they can't. And organizing people who are already traumatized and arming them uh, is kind of a hard one to get moving in the right direction. Now, I will say that a couple of the times, at the very beginning, of the, when we worked with those villages in, in northern India, and we had not yet perfected the techniques of Pacific movement into freedom, there were some conflicts, and people died. And we don't, you know, we don't, we don't put that in the posters, right? Uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't, you, it wasn't the people in slavery who died. It was the slaveholders who died. And uh, because there were just some very, very angry ex-slaves, especially the women, because they were being sexually assaulted. And, and people died. I have to say, I'm a, of a particular bent that armed uh, conflict is not my thing, really. I, you know, I, I tend to be on the Pacific end of things. Uh, I think we can probably find other ways forward. Uh, but there are certainly those moments of frustration and, and almost terror when you think, <laughs> where you begin to think in, in violent terms. But I don't think violence is the right way to go. In fact, I think if there's any place in the world which demonstrates that violence is the wrong way to, to end slavery, it's the United States. Right? We, we brought slavery to an end here at a cost of what, two million dead? Something like that, or even more? if you counted the people that weren't counted as just battlefield casualties, and then it didn't even work well, right? I mean, I, don't, I think the, 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 the greatest lesson, that, one of the greatest lessons the United States has to teach the world is don't try to stop slavery by having a civil war over it. But yeah. in the case of the Yazidis, when the Kurds in Syria, the, the, the YPG and the YPK, the Women's Protection Movement, they, they were able to send off <coughs> Hold on a sec, though, because you're taking up her chance to. Yeah. 
And this is our last one. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, in hearing you speak, I was reminded of one of your predecessors, uh, Amartya Sen, who gave the Weinstock Lecture. And Amartya Sen uh, spoke extensively about what he called unfreedom. Yes. And he wasn't referring, of course, to the type of chattel slavery or collateralized debt slavery that you're talking about, but forms of work uh, which are coerced or exhibit some type of unfreedom. Yeah. Uh, undocumented workers in the Central Valley, low-cost yeah. Dalit in India, uh, gulag labor in China. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. If you were to include all of those, it wouldn't be 45 million. It would probably be 10 times that. And I'm wondering whether that, in a sense, that observation, whether you, you think that's useful or right, and secondly, whether that would add to your movement politically, that connection between unfreedom and modern mm -hmm. slavery, mm -hmm. or in a weird way might dilute the efficacy of your movement. That's a very interesting idea and thought. I, I'll exp I, I, let me point out that unfreedom is, is, as Sin talks about it, is exactly what you've talked about, that it, it, it's, it's a very wide continuum ac across these types of, of treatment. Um, within the world where we talk about slavery, and I have to say the definition of slavery was incredibly problematic at the beginning of this anti-slavery movement. And, the, and, it, and probably 15 years were lost in arguments about what is human trafficking and what is not and all this kind of stuff. Um, there's been a resolution of that issue and it all, it all hinges around uh, the, the, uh, the adoption of what are fundamentally the, 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 the definition in the 1926 League of Nations uh, Convention, which I, you know, but I'll just point out that it says uh, that if a person is treated as if they are property and that you can use the indications of what you can do with property to determine if a person is caught up in slavery. So what can you do with your own property? You know, you can use it, you can buy it, you can sell it, you can rent it out, you can mortgage it, you can destroy it, mm -hmm. right? So if, it, if you could treat another human being exactly as you would, you know, my plastic bottle of water, um, that's a person in slavery. Now, what that means is that it then takes us up to the edge of some of the workers that you just described that sin would have put in the space of unfreedom the kind of horrific types of work which don't necessarily cross the line into the, the being able to extinguish them as if they were your property. And it's a very interesting and open question that you've raised. It's like, what if we did? What if we did expand that definition? I might want to just lie down for a while because the, the definitional arguments went on for so many years, I don't want to start anymore. But it, it, you're right, it might change the way people understood. But I don't want to dilute the reality of enslavement either. Right? I absolutely don't want to do that. So I'll stop there. I'm sure we could go all night. Yeah. I'm sure we could. I, again, I want to thank everyone for attending. I, um, I want to just re reinforce that this is a two-day um, event. Tomorrow we're going to have a panel discussion here at 4 o'clock, a little bit after 4 o'clock, um, with uh, you know, the three professors hosted by or moderated by Professor Watts on the committee and also with uh, Professor Bales here. So uh, I encourage you all to continue the discussion. I really want to thank you. This is a fantastic lecture and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.